What's up, biology students? Mr. Holloway here. In today's video, we're going to talk a bit about sustainability and what exactly that term means. We're also going to talk about several of the biggest threats to our environment, each linked in some way or another to the growing human population, as well as how these threats might be addressed in planning for a sustainable future here on planet Earth. Sustainability is almost exactly what it sounds like. It is the ability to sustain something or keep it going for a long period of time. As our population continues to develop and advance both technologically and socially, we need to think about ways to develop sustainably so that we are meeting the needs of all humans on our planet without degrading the environment that provides us with those resources that we need. Humans, like all organisms, depend on our environment for our survival. No environment, no organisms, no exceptions. When humans go into space, for example, they have to create an artificial environment, and if that environment breaks down, the humans will die. That kind of artificial environment is never as good as an ecosystem at meeting the needs of humans, or any organisms for that matter. Living systems, as it turns out, are remarkably effective at supporting life, and it is life itself that holds these systems together. Biodiversity is to an environment as rivets or bolts are to an airplane. The more bolts you lose, the less likely your airplane is to stay in the sky. And if you lose enough bolts, the airplane starts to come apart and crashes back down to Earth. In an ecosystem, the diversity of life present in that system strengthens the system overall. Obviously, individual organisms die all the time as they are eaten by others or as they fall victim to disease or natural disasters, but when whole groups of organisms start to be lost, the ecosystem begins to slowly lose integrity. And if you lose enough biodiversity and those niches go unfilled, then the ecosystem is really in trouble and it may lose its ability to support living organisms over time. At this point, you may be wondering, Mr. Holloway, what's with all the statues? Well, this is Easter Island. You may have heard of it. It's one of the most remote islands in the world and features these enormous stone statues created by the initial inhabitants of this island. And here's why Easter Island is important in a video about sustainability. This island was once covered in a dense forest. To build these statues and their civilization, the original inhabitants of Easter Island deforested the entire island over a period of time that was long enough for the change to seem very gradual and almost unnoticeable to humans. Eventually, their society collapsed along with their environment and the original Easter Islanders died out. Unable or unwilling to plan for their future, or maybe because they simply didn't know any better, the Easter Islanders caused their own extinction by overexploiting the resources on their tiny island, to the point where the island could no longer support their population. Today's human population is certainly a lot more technologically advanced than the Easter Islanders were, and more aware of our own impact on the environment. But we often consume this planet's resources as if the same rules don't apply to us anymore. True, humans are unique in being able to solve our problems, but at least for now, we only have one planet, and that one planet has only so many resources on it. And if we want to avoid the consequences that the Easter Islanders brought upon themselves, then we need to protect our planet's biodiversity, because that biodiversity is what holds our planet's ecosystems together, ultimately allowing them to provide us with a tremendous wealth of goods and services that we depend on for our very survival. That's what sustainable development is all about, providing for the needs of all humans on our planet and finding ways to allow for the advancement of the human species while also protecting our planet's biodiversity and resources for future generations to utilize and enjoy. This slide describes some of the biggest threats to biodiversity on our planet, each of which is tied, in some way or another, to human activity and population growth. As we plan for our sustainable future, we need to take these threats into account and come up with solutions to problems caused by our actions and alternative methods of doing things that prevent these kinds of problems from intensifying. And in so doing, we will be protecting the system that supports our existence on this planet. Let's start with habitat loss, which is a huge threat to biodiversity that we've talked a little bit about before. Human settlements don't look much like what we think of as nature, as you are probably aware. And when we build shops, houses, malls, movie theaters, landfills, anything really, we convert natural habitat into something at least somewhat artificial. And this usually leads to decreased biodiversity. Parking lots just don't support pollinating insects like bees and butterflies in the way that natural meadows and prairies do. But what if they could? What if when we built a new structure, we designed it not only to meet our needs in terms of housing, office, or manufacturing space, but also designed it to mimic a natural ecosystem, providing crucial habitat that would otherwise disappear under asphalt and cement? It's totally possible, and engineers, designers, and architects are starting to do just this kind of thing. 
Green roofs, like the one at the Ford Motor Company in Dearborn, Michigan, are designed to promote primary productivity, the plants at the bottom of the food web. These plants, like a natural prairie ecosystem, support birds, insects, and small mammals, and also help to filter and clean rainwater and runoff, keep the building cool, reduce energy costs, and help protect the building from ultraviolet radiation, meaning the structure will last longer than it might otherwise. It's essentially a 10.4 acre garden, and it is beneficial for both humans and the environment. Other facilities use similar principles to grow vegetable gardens in urban areas, giving people increased access to fresh produce and saving fuel since the vegetables don't have to be shipped in from another country, state, or county. Imagine if we could design whole cities this way. We can also help to mediate the effects of habitat loss by building corridors or pathways that allow animals to move back and forth between patches of natural habitat without having to cross through human settlements. Countless animals are killed by vehicles every year, or, like the bears around here in Colorado, find themselves getting into trouble when they wander into neighborhoods in search of food. Building corridors, like the ones we see here on this slide, that connect pieces of habitat that have been isolated from one another due to human settlement, uh, have been shown to prevent collisions with animals, keeping both humans and animals safer. Large carnivores with large hunting ranges, like bears, wolves, pumas, uh, and the like, are most likely to be affected negatively by habitat loss, and many large carnivores around the world are endangered as a result of widespread habitat loss. These kinds of animals are also the ones that benefit the most from sustainable development, because it allows them to continue living and hunting with a lot less risk of running into humans. Severe alterations in ecosystem structure occur when something like a keystone species is removed from an ecosystem. Because these keystone species have a stabilizing influence on the ecosystem overall, when they're removed, it has a ripple effect on the rest of the ecosystem. We've learned about a couple examples of this this year. For example, when wolves were removed from Yellowstone, populations of large grazing animals like elk, deer, and buffalo increased dramatically and became sickly without any predators to take out the weakest members of the herd. We also learned about how sea urchins take over and destroy entire kelp forests when sea otters, their main predator, are removed from coastal ecosystems. Recognizing this, we have established laws and policies meant to protect not only these kinds of keystone species, but also the ecosystems in which they live. The national park system in the United States is devoted exactly to that mission, to protect pieces of land that support some of Earth's most amazing creatures and landscapes. Species on the Endangered Species List, or the IUCN Red List, are entitled to special protection and cannot be hunted or traded, nor have their habitat removed. Additionally, we've identified areas around the world with extraordinarily high biodiversity, and we call these biodiversity hotspots, and we have set up systems to manage and protect these areas as well. Numerous important medicines have their origins in biodiversity, from the pain reliever aspirin, which originally came from a tree, to the anti-cancer drug Taxol, which also originally came from a tree. Recently, a drug was synthesized that appears to be an effective weapon against HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, and it was derived from bee venom. In some of these biodiversity hotspots, there are so many plants and animals that we haven't even been able to identify and describe them all yet, let alone find out if they have any properties or abilities that might be useful to humans. Cures for numerous diseases could be lying in wait in some rare jungle flower, and we'd never know it if we cut down the forest and built a housing development. So part of sustainable development involves protecting these biodiversity hotspots, not only because they support numerous rare and interesting plants and animals, but because of their immense potential to benefit our lives by remaining intact. After habitat loss, the introduction of non-native or alien species to an ecosystem is the second greatest cause of biodiversity loss. Certain introduced species can outcompete native species because they don't have any natural predators in that new ecosystem, and they can gradually crowd out, consume, or otherwise decimate entire populations of native organisms that just can't compete. Often, these species are introduced by accident, as was the case with the Burmese pythons introduced to the Everglades of Florida. Well, I guess it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. You see, the Burmese python was brought to the U.S. in the international pet trade. People buy these creatures as pets when they are small, but they can grow very, very large if well cared for. Invariably, as pets that aren't really domesticated will do, some pythons escaped. Others were almost certainly set free by careless owners, and in areas like the Florida Everglades, where the climate is suitably warm for pythons, 
These aliens took up residence, establishing a breeding population, and now they're eating everything in their sight, from rare birds to alligators. There are countless other examples. The zebra mussels clogging up pipes and waterways in the Great Lakes were introduced by accident, most likely through the shipping of goods on waterways leading into and out of the Great Lakes region. Lionfish were introduced to the eastern and gulf coasts of the U.S. in much the same way that pythons were. The kudzu vine and the nutria were both introduced intentionally. The kudzu as a means of preventing erosion, and the nutria as a source of fur for early fur traders in the northwestern United States. Kudzu, however, grows so fast that it literally engulfs entire forests in the south and is currently growing out of control. The nutria reproduces very rapidly as well, and its digging and burrowing behavior make it quite a pest since it ruins gardens, crops, and parklands. The effect of invasive species is costing us about $1.4 trillion annually. So part of sustainable development must involve finding ways to prevent the spread of invasive species and to repair the damage that they have done already. Since one of the major problems with invasive species is that they lack natural predators in their new ecosystem, studying how they existed in balance with other organisms in their original ecosystem can help us bring them back into balance in invaded ecosystems as well. For example, certain species of weevils have proven moderately effective at controlling invasive plant species, like the aquatic water lettuce choking the lake in this image. Other species of weevil may be effective at controlling the knapweed populations that are so invasive to our own ecosystem here in Colorado. And controlling the spread of invasive species will help preserve native biodiversity in numerous ecosystems around the world. And this will ultimately benefit humans because it will save us money and will protect ecosystem goods and services that we depend on. Another big threat to biodiversity is the over-exploitation of biological resources. Overhunting and overfishing a species faster than it is able to reproduce itself can ultimately lead to extinction, as can the removal of organisms from the wild for more frivolous purposes, such as for the ivory found in rhino horn or elephant tusk. In 2013, the western black rhino was officially declared extinct, due primarily to being poached for its ivory horn. This species will never be seen on Earth again because of human activities. A surprising number of organisms are also endangered, at least in part, because of the black market wildlife trade, like the golden lion tamarind, for example. Birds, mammals, tropical fish, insects, reptiles, amphibians, pretty much any group of organisms you can name, has members who are so prized for their qualities that certain people are willing to keep removing them from the wild no matter how few are left. In fact, it is almost never wise to purchase exotic animals or animal products that have been removed from the wild, because there's a pretty good chance that they were removed illegally at the detriment of their entire species. But let's think beyond just our biological resources. Humans have a big problem over-exploiting many resources, both living and non-living. For us to understand why this is an issue, we need to understand the difference between renewable and non-renewable resources. Certain resources that we take from our planet were there from the moment our planet formed, and since there is no force in nature capable of regenerating them for us, when they are used up, they will be gone forever. Other resources, like many of the ones we use to provide us with energy, are generated by our planet, but over such a long period of time that they may as well be gone forever if we use them up. Oil and coal in particular take millions of years to form from the breakdown of organic matter, in fact, the oil we are using today began generating about 300 to 360 million years ago in the Carboniferous period. Humans are on pace to use these up in less than 2,000 years. Sustainable development emphasizes the use of renewable resources like solar, wind, hydroelectric, and geothermal energy instead of non-renewable resources. That way, we can be sure that they will continue to be available for us and for every generation to come after us. In addition to the endless supply of these resources that can be provided by our environment, most of these resources produce far less pollution and cause far less environmental harm than their non-renewable alternatives. In addition to utilizing renewable resources wherever possible, humans can make their best effort to recycle the non-renewable resources that we are forced to consume when renewables are not available. Being recyclable is different than being renewable, and a lot of people confuse these two things. Recycling is just finding a way to reuse the same piece of material over again. 
Certain renewable resources, like paper, which comes from trees that can regrow themselves, are also recyclable. But being renewable is different because a renewable resource will regenerate itself naturally within the earth. When you recycle an aluminum can, it's not as though the planet is making any brand new aluminum. It's just that that piece of aluminum that was already removed from the earth is being used more than once. Recycling our non-renewable resources also takes less energy than obtaining new resources to replace the ones we throw away. For example, recycling an aluminum can to create a new aluminum can uses only a tiny fraction of the energy it takes to mine for new bauxite ore, process it into aluminum, and then make it into a new can. This in turn reduces our demand for energy and makes it all the more likely that renewable sources of energy will be abundant enough to meet our needs. In addition to recycling and using renewable resources whenever possible, we can also preserve our biological resources by finding ways to make them economically valuable without exploiting them. For example, ecotourism, or tourism based on visiting and experiencing nature, generates billions of dollars every year. And if it's more valuable for a community to keep their gorillas, rhinos, and elephants alive for tourists to see, than it is for them to kill these animals for food and to make room for humans to use the land in other ways, then those organisms will be protected because protecting them is what supports the community financially. In this way, the community is making money and supporting itself while also protecting the planet's biological resources. If you've ever been to a national park, then you are an ecotourist, and the money you spent to get into the park is going to support the continued protection of that piece of nature. There are numerous exciting opportunities around the world for an eco-tourist, but as with many things, it is also very important to do your homework and to find out if the company or organization you are giving your money to is reputable. There are unfortunately all too many instances of people taking advantage of eco-tourists by selling them a great experience, but doing little or nothing to put that money towards the protection of nature. And in these cases, the tourists unknowingly do more harm than good because their presence disturbs an ecosystem that isn't really being very well preserved. Similarly, it is important to know where your food is coming from and to ensure that it is harvested sustainably. This is particularly important with seafood, since seafood is still really one of the only sources of food that we take from the wild rather than raising it ourselves on farms and ranches. Because the human population is growing rapidly, and because such a significant percentage of the world's populations live close to the coast, the demand for seafood is higher than it has ever been. As such, wild fish stocks are suffering, and fisheries around the world are in decline. But what if we could raise fish in a farm, rather than having to take it from the ocean? Well, in fact, we can, and this is called aquaculture. And we can see examples of how this looks here in some of these pictures, where fish are raised in pens, in waterways, so that they are contained and can be monitored. In fact, aquaculture is stepping up and helping us to meet the growing demand for seafood. Aquaculture, like conventional agriculture, causes its own set of environmental problems, but I guess we could say the same about ecotourism, which has far more of an impact on the environment than if we just left the ecosystem entirely undisturbed and never visited it in any way. So we just need to ask ourselves, is the problem caused by aquaculture and by ecotourism, are these better or worse than the problems caused by the alternatives? Because ecosystems respond slowly to things like the addition of pollution, Sometimes we don't notice the effects until the consequences are quite severe. For example, we discovered the hole in the ozone layer in part because amphibians in the southern hemisphere were dying at alarming rates. The ozone layer helps protect our planet from ultraviolet radiation emitted by the sun, and some amphibians are particularly sensitive to UV rays. It turns out that the ozone gas in the atmosphere was reacting with chemicals called CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons. These chemicals were being used by humans as a coolant and as a propellant in aerosol sprays. Each CFC molecule can react with and ultimately destroy thousands of ozone molecules. So the more CFCs humans used, the worse the hole in the ozone layer would become and the more UV radiation would hit our planet. So humans from around the world got together at the Montreal Convention in 1987 and drafted the Montreal Protocol a plan for phasing out the use of CFCs and replacing them with other chemicals that wouldn't damage the ozone layer. But that much damage takes quite a while to reverse. We can see in this first picture, even after the Montreal Protocol was enacted, the hole in the ozone grew worse, indicated here in blue, right up to the turn of the century. 
We can see in this graph, however, that eventually the concentration of CFCs in the atmosphere began to level off and are projected to drop slowly over the next several decades. By 2042, the ozone layer is projected to be back to where it was before humans started putting all those CFCs in the atmosphere, which is a great deal better than where we would be by 2042 without the Montreal Protocol, remembering that blue in these figures represents low concentrations of ozone in the atmosphere, and that green, yellow, and orange represent an increasingly high concentration of ozone. Planning for the future means learning from the mistakes of the past, and the hole in the ozone layer is only one example of where humans were smart enough to realize the consequences of their actions and manage to fix the problems that these actions had caused. The story of DDT is pretty similar. DDT is a chemical pesticide that was widely used to control mosquito populations starting in the late 1940s. We used tons of this stuff, and even went so far as to spray it all over ourselves and our children. Enter the bald eagle, our national bird and a symbol of our great country. In the space of only a few years, bald eagle populations dropped substantially, and as you can see in this graph, there seemed to be a correlation between this drop and our use of DDT. Scientists discovered that the eagles were in decline because something was wrong with their eggs. They were incredibly soft, so soft that if a mother eagle sat on them, they would be crushed and the chicks inside killed. The problem, we discovered, was due to a phenomenon we now call biological magnification, which we can see illustrated to us in this figure. Basically, the way this works is that a small amount of pollution exists in the water, and is absorbed by primary producers. These are eaten by consumers, and the pollutant is passed up the food chain. Except that it builds up the further up the food chain you go, because each eagle eats many large fish, each containing these pollutants. These large fish contain pollutants because they eat many smaller fish, each of which contain some of the pollutant inside of them, and so forth. We call this phenomenon biological magnification because the concentration of this pollutant, in this case DDT, becomes magnified as it moves up through the food chain. Eagles, being at the top of the food chain, were receiving a tremendous dose of this pollutant, and it was causing them to lay soft-shelled eggs, leading to their decline. The same thing happens with mercury in oceanic food webs. In 1962, a scientist named Rachel Carson wrote a really important book called Silent Spring, drawing attention to the pollution issue and ultimately doing a great deal to help motivate people to help save the birds from the threats of DDT and other chemical pollutants. The title Silent Spring came from her contention that without action, our ability to pollute our environment might result in a world where you would hear no bird songs because all the birds had died. Fortunately, just as we did with the hole in the ozone layer, humans recognized the problem and took steps to solve it, and now the bald eagle is no longer endangered. However, sometimes it takes us a long time to recognize the problems caused by our actions, and we put off doing anything about these problems, sometimes to our own detriment. Such is the case with global climate change. This is supposedly a controversial issue, but this supposed controversy does not exist in the scientific community because scientists overwhelmingly and almost universally agree that the global climate is changing, that it is not part of a natural climate cycle, and that the problem is excess CO2 in the atmosphere put there by humans and human activities. What a changing climate means for our planet is a little tougher to pin down, and although the overall effect of climate change will almost certainly be negative, it is important to acknowledge that we do not know for sure what the long-term effects on humans or the environment will be. Climate change is nothing new, and our planet's climate has changed numerous times over the past 4.5 billion years. Over the past 400,000 years, which is the period covered by these particular graphs, we can see that atmospheric CO2 has fluctuated in cycles lasting about 100,000 years. You should also notice that changes in the average temperature of our planet almost precisely match the changes in CO2 in our atmosphere, indicating that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is directly related to the temperature of our planet, and more CO2 means a warmer planet overall. You should also notice that over the past 400,000 years, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has never gone much above 300 parts per million. When this graph was made, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was 385 parts per million, and earlier in 2013, our atmosphere clocked in at 400 parts per million for the first time in millions of years. This is completely unprecedented, and humans have never existed in an atmosphere with this much carbon, 
and is beyond the scope of any natural climate cycle that we've experienced in the entire lifetime of our species. Although climate has changed on this planet before, it usually changes slowly enough for natural populations to adapt to these changes. Today, climate change is happening much faster than that, and natural populations may not be able to keep up, which is exactly why we ought to be concerned about what climate change will mean for our future. The thing is, we know exactly what we need to do to solve the climate change problem. It's not an easy solution, and it's one that will require that we adjust our way of life considerably, but it is certainly not as though there are no solutions to this problem. When CFCs were the problem, we stopped using CFCs, and the ozone layer is starting to show signs of recovery. When DDT was the problem, we stopped using DDT, and the eagles rebounded. Today, we know that CO2 is the problem, and we know exactly where it's coming from, the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. We also know who's burning those fossil fuels and putting that CO2 in the atmosphere. And unfortunately, the USA is one of the biggest sources of atmospheric carbon on the planet, right up there with China and India, both of which have populations that exceed ours by almost a billion people. But this isn't an American problem or a Chinese problem. It's a global problem that will affect everyone, regardless of whether they contributed to the problem or not. For example, millions of humans on continents around the world live in communities threatened by rising sea levels, communities that may be underwater by the end of this century. But it doesn't have to be that way. All we have to do is acknowledge the problem and its root causes, and then take intentional steps to fix the problem by addressing these root causes. There are numerous renewable sources of energy that do not put CO2 into the atmosphere, from solar to wind to fuels produced by genetically engineered algae that takes CO2 out of the atmosphere in order to produce these fuels. Although it will not be easy to quit fossil fuels and adopt these renewable sources of energy in their place, it is necessary for our planet and for our prolonged existence on this planet. And the sooner we begin to make the transition, the easier the transition will be for us and the better off future generations of humans will be. Because that's really what sustainable development is all about. It's about asking ourselves what we want our future to look like. Do we want a bright future with plenty of food for everyone, clean air and water, and endless supplies of energy provided by nature itself? A future where tigers, rhinos, and coral reefs still exist, and where humans live in harmony with one another and cooperation instead of competition because there are plenty of resources for everyone? Or do we want a future where our most precious resources have been used up, and where clean air and soil are commodities to be purchased instead of being free and available for everyone? Do we want a future where wars are fought over access to clean, uncontaminated water, and where the oceans are devoid of life due to overfishing? Before you answer, keep in mind that these are real photos we are looking at on this slide, and that there are already places on planet Earth where the pollution is bad enough to black out the sky, and where the only drinking water available may give you cholera or some other disease, and where you'd better wear a mask if you go outside because the pollution is so bad. These are not problems of the future. These are problems of the present. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my future to look like these photos. In which case, something like this looks pretty darn good. And there are quite a few people on Earth working to make this future a reality for all of us. But they cannot do it alone, and without the support of all humans the world over. Ultimately, whatever our future looks like, it will look like that because of choices that we as human beings make now, today, in this generation. So it is up to each of us to ask ourselves this question about what we want the future to be, so that we can get started on creating it for ourselves. I know that some of these issues seem overwhelming, and they might make us feel hopeless from time to time, but all these problems are solvable. And humans are ingenious creatures with brains capable of solving almost any problem we put our minds to. But solving problems involves learning about those problems, not ignoring them. So that's why I think it's important to make ourselves look at the bad stuff that humans do to each other and to the environment so that we can understand how we might work to make our planet a better place for everyone. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Thanks again for watching, and remember that you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need to until you feel like you understand the concepts. See you next time!